I'm telling you, that vacation was good for him, wasn't it? I'm telling you, starting our service off with a bang. I'm so glad you're here. So glad you made it to the house of the Lord this morning. Are you glad you're here? Say amen. amen. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. I'm telling you, I don't know of a better place I'd rather be than right here in God's house on his day with his people. Boy, y'all look good. Amen. So good to see all of you. Amen. We got some new newlyweds back there in the back. I'm telling you, Jason and Beth, and I'm grateful and thankful they're here. Boy, they drove a long way to come be with us today and uh, got married last year, and I'm so glad they're here. I had a little part in, in uh, talking to them and praying with them and seeking God's will for them, and I'm just glad it's working out. Amen. God knows, don't he? He sure does. Then old brother Wendell Flood's here this morning. What about that now, boy? Y'all better straighten up. I better straighten up. Hey, Amen. He'll tell the sheriff on me. <clears throat> but anyway, I'm glad he's here and uh, glad all of you here. Dr. Corey Wright's in the building. Hey, Amen. I'm glad he's here this morning. Hey, Amen. So good to have him. And I'm so thankful he could be with us this morning. All of you, some of you have been on vacation and you're back refreshed and ready and all that good stuff. These girls up here are smiling because they're ready to go on vacation again. They're going this week. So they're real excited about that. They're afraid I was going to let them down, but I'm not. Anyway, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Some of you had a good week. Some of you has been hot where you at. Sister Kathy said it's been so hot where she was at this week that she's not even going to complain when cold weather gets here. I thought I might all write that down and get her decided, but I'm not. <laughs> I go hold her to that, but boy, I'm telling you, it has been hot, but I'm glad God is taking care of us. So let's pray together. Ask the Lord to help us. He knows what we stand in need of. I'm going to ask my friend, Brother Corey, if he will pray for us, take us to the throne of grace, and ask God to work in a mighty way here among us today. Lord, we're so grateful for being in our house this morning. God, we're glad, Lord, that we can gather together in this great country and honor you. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity, Lord, to uh, come together and to live in your name and to honor you. We pray, God, that you'd be with the remaining of the service. I pray, Brother Joel, as he comes, sharing with us, God, the remaining of the music. God, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come, Lord, would uh, speak to our hearts, speak to our lives. God, we would leave out here better than we ever come. God, we know it's only about you and what you do in our hearts and our lives. We give you honor and give you glory. We may we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't forget tonight, our evening worship service starts at 6. And then, of course, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Don't forget that. And don't forget to pray. You need to pray this week. We've got several churches that are calling out for prayer and asking God to touch most of you. Uh, I don't know, you'd have to have to be somewhere far out in the woods and not have contact with nothing if you don't know what's going on and there's an attempt made on uh, our former president Trump yesterday to shoot him assassinate him and I liked his statement this morning someone shared with me that he was thanking God and that it was God that intervened for him and I'm grateful and thankful for that but uh, we, we, we just need to pray for our nation we really do and ask God to help him during these days and guide us and uh, direct us. So let's uh, let's do that this week and pray and ask God to help. All right, Amen. All right, Brother Daniel, come on, lead us in some good singing.
let's all stand as the choir comes down. I could tell of the story when thousands were fed, when he lifted the sick, when he raised up the dead. I could sing of the others like the blind made to see, but I'd rather tell you what's happened to me. I'm saved to the uttermost, and I know that I am washed in the blood of the precious Lamb. Through the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Ghost, I'm saved to the uttermost. Once I was lost, but now I am found in the book of life. My name's written down, now I'm part of the family, I'm a child of the King. This is the story, this is my song to sing. You must be forgiven to make heaven your home. The good life you're living won't do it alone. So trust in the Savior and he'll save you today. And with blessed assurance, you too can say, I'm saved to the uttermost and I know that I am. Washed in the blood of the precious Lamb Through the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Ghost I'm saved to the uttermost If you're saved, sing it with me I'm saved to the uttermost And I know that I am Are you washed? Washed in the blood of the of the precious Lamb, through the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Ghost, I'm saved through the uttermost. Through the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Ghost, I'm saved to the uttermost. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I know that I'm saved. I'm telling you, and I'm thankful uh, for the Lord's salvation that he brought in my heart and my life many years ago. If you have your Bibles, open them to the book of Luke. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 14. You thought I was going to say Matthew. We've been in Matthew for several weeks, but we are going to look at another story that the Lord Jesus here is telling. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 14. 14. I'll give you a little background. Nobody tells a story like Jesus. And I've been looking at the stories that he told while he was here upon this earth. There are many, many of them. I don't know if we'll look at all of them or not, but I've been looking at several of them. They're called parables. And they're an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And, of course, in the context of this scripture I'm about to read, I'll give you a little background. That way we won't read all the chapter. But back in chapter 14, verse number 1 in this chapter, when he begins, of course, the Bible says that he is in a house with a chief Pharisee, and uh, there he's on the Sabbath day, and he sat down to eat. 
And in comes this uh, person. There's others that are there watching him, Pharisees, scribes. They were always intrigued by Jesus and always wanted to look for something they could point out or something they could find to be critical of. He's eating bread on the Sabbath day, and uh, they are watching him. And the Bible says that comes in a man with dropsy. In the midst of this uh, banquet, in the midst of this eating, in the midst of this meal, he's enjoying bread together with folks. Comes in a man with dropsy. Now, dropsy is fluid retention. It's uh, dropsy, hydropsy, or swelling of the body. And the Lord sees that, the buildup of fluid in these body tissues. And so the law, he asked the lawyers and the Pharisees that are sitting around him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Because that's what they're looking at. What are you going to do to break God's law? So we can tell everybody that you're a, a, a vile, crooked person. You're not, you're not living by God's holy law. And of course, he came to fulfill the law. He is perfect. In verse number four, they held their peace. They didn't say anything. They, they, they wouldn't even answer him. And so he took this man and healed him on the Sabbath day, and he let him go. And then Jesus looks at them, and he says, Well, how many of y'all would have an animal fall in a pit, and you'd leave him there because it's Sabbath day? You wouldn't do that. That's what he's saying. You'd help him. If he saw he's in need, your animal in need, you'd help him. You'd pull him out on Sabbath day. And so they couldn't answer him again. These things, when he asked them that, wouldn't you pull him out? They wouldn't even answer. And then you come to verse 7. He starts a, another story we may look at later. And uh, the Bible said there in verse 7, he put forth a parable to those who were bidden, those that had come to this gathering he was at. Uh, but uh, they marked how uh, they chose out the chief rooms, the, the, the seating there. They were real special about letting the Upper echelon people, come on over here. You sit over here. Oh, well, I don't know if you even got an invitation. You, you, no, you, you have to sit back over here. You just have to wait. And how they were doing people coming in. So Jesus tells the parable of the wedding feast. We may look at it later. But I want to draw your attention, of course, in it. He tells them how to be humble and how not to exalt ourselves. But then he comes to this parable I want us to see today. This parable of the great banquet. And it starts here, actually, in verse number 12. He's talking to the person that invited him to come and eat. So if you're able and can, if you will, stand with me. And uh, we'll, in honor of God's word, we'll read these verses, and then we'll draw out of them what God has for us today. Verse number 12. Then said he also to him that made him, the guy that invited him, When thou makest a dinner or supper, call not the friends, nor the brethren, Neither the kinsmen nor the rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. Uh, call them with the right reason. If you want to throw a feast, throw it for the right reason. Verse 13, when he had, thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. I like the way the Bible puts that. And then in verse number 15, the Bible says, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said, this man said this, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now he's moving Jesus from what's happening here earthly to think about what's going to happen in the future. Now look at verse 16. This is where the story starts. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first one said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excuse. Verse 19. And another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Verse 20, and another one, the third one, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. Look here in verse 22. And the servant said, Lord, 
It is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Verse 24, For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. You can be seated. Let's pray. Father, and I ask that you would open to us this story, Lord Jesus, that you told many years ago when you walked upon this earth. And help us, Lord, to be open and receptive to what you have for us today. As you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. You're the only one that can do that. And I'm grateful and thankful that you're still doing that in our day and age in which we're living. So I ask you, Lord, to speak to us in a real way this morning. Help us to see and understand what you have for us. That we'll leave here changed by the power of your word and the presence of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, of course, the Bible talks about here in these verses what I want to talk to you about. And that is the invitation. The invitation. The Bible talks about it here in these verses. The invitation. In a few minutes, we'll give an invitation, what we call an invitational hymn at the close of our service. And we'll invite folks to come, invite you to come and do business with God. See, that's what we come here for, to do business with the Lord. Let him speak to us, worship him, adore him, raise him up, and allow God to speak to us in a miraculous way. And he's the only one that can do that. I'm telling you, there's a lot of places you go to, they're real emotional, they do all kinds of things, and I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying you, the main purpose of you coming to church is allow God to meet with you and you with him. And it's all about that meeting and that worship. It's all about us collectively, together, together. Of course, the Bible instructs us to do that, but it's more about us hearing from God individually, allowing God to do a work in our heart. And we'll call for that invitation for you to respond to what God is doing in your life. Maybe you won't come pray. Maybe you won't come join our church. Maybe you need to be saved. You've never trusted the Lord as your personal Savior. As God opens your heart, and he's the only one that can truly reveal that to you, And as he does that, he can call you to salvation. I'm glad he's still in the calling business. And so on the good authority of the word of God, I want to talk about this invitation. And of course, the Bible talks about it many, many places. You might say the entire Bible is an invitational letter to lost mankind from God that you might come to the Lord and be saved. That's what God wants to do in your heart and your life. I'm giving this invitation on the authority of the Bible. Many, many places it calls and talks for that. Revelation 22, verse 17, that last book of the Bible, the last page of the Bible says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth, that's us that's been saved, we've heard the word of God, we've responded, let him that heareth say, Come. We, we, We invite them, we encourage them. To listen to God. Allow God to speak to your heart. And then the Bible says, and uh, uh, whosoever's a thirst, let him come. That's those that are not saved. Those that haven't tasted the Lord. Those that don't know this salvation. Let him come. And and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Now, of course, God has to do that. God has to open the heart to the realization that you're lost That's the only way you ever got saved. If you're saved here this morning, you've trusted the Lord as your personal Savior. The only way that happened ever in your life was God revealed that to you. God pulled off the shackles off your your eyes, spiritually speaking. Uh, He took off the blinders so that you could see yourself as a lost sinner. And then God began to open your heart to the truth, the realization that you needed to trust him as your only hope of heaven. That's the only way anybody gets saved. Now, a lot of people go through emotion, say a little prayer, and they're just not saved. Their life don't change. Nothing's happened in their life. And, and boy, you, you know, they tell all. Oh, I worked with a guy one time, Brother Corey, and this is the truth. He cussed, he drank, he ran around on his wife, and I'd try to witness to him, and he'd say it in front of the boys, sitting around the table there as we'd come in for lunch. He said, well, once saved, always saved. Ain't that right, Rev? And he'd look at me. I said, yeah, that's right, but you've got to truly be saved if that's true in your life. Because that's a fact. You can go through a motion, say a little prayer, and you ain't got it no more than that dog of mine out there has got it. He can't even talk. Uh, But what I'm saying is, of course, the Bible speaks of this very thing. 
in the Bible talks about this very thing. God is the one that opens the heart. Now this story Jesus has told us, we've been looking at several of them. I want to explain a little bit from this story about the gospel invitation because that's what Jesus is relating to these people that are sitting around him. He's invited to go out and eat with some Pharisees. He did eat with the Pharisees and publicans. Huh? About the little girl, I heard about the little girl went to went to uh, Sunday school. She come home all excited. She said, "Mama, my name is in the Bible." And her name was Edith. And uh, the, the, the the mama told her, she "said Well, darling, I, I love you." But she said, "I don't, I don't think so." She said, "Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Edith is in the Bible." She said, "You you believe that?" She said, "That's exactly. I heard it this morning in Sunday school. My Sunday school teacher said that Jesus came." to the Pharisees and the publicans and eat it with them. And I'm right there with them. Amen. Well, uh, I'm glad in this story Jesus is going to explain to us, of course, concerning God's invitation and how we can respond to God's invitation, the importance of responding to God's invitation. Jesus told this parable about a man and a great supper. He's been invited to a supper. He's invited to come and eat bread with these folks. In the midst of that, a guy comes in this sick, needs healing, and he heals him. And of course, this salvation that Jesus goes on to talk about, uh, when another man makes a statement about eating in the kingdom, he's revealing to them how you're going to be a part of that eating in the kingdom. In this story, a salvation feast is what he's talking about here, not a funeral. A lot of people think, boy, when all you church folks get together, it's just a funeral. No, we don't, we don't we get together for funerals, all right, but we rejoice if the saint has been saved and he's in a better place than I did this past week. And I'm thankful that I have that assurance yes, from the Word of God, the truth of God's Word. Jesus said that this, sal- this salvation is like a great supper. Salvation is a feast, not a funeral. It's a banquet. It's not a concentration camp. It's compared to a great supper. And in this comparison, he says not just any supper, but a great supper. Aren't you glad of that? Not an ordinary supper, but a great supper. So I want you to think about for a moment the greatest dinner you've ever been invited to. Now, I've been invited to some mm, uppity things for old country boy. I'm telling you, I've been to some uppity events. I've eaten breakfast with the governor. Not the one we got now, but previous one. Invited to a banquet there to eat breakfast with him. I've been in a banquet, sit, sit at the same table with Tommy Irvin. Used to be the Georgia Department of Agriculture Commissioner. Sit at the same table and eat with him. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, man, I've been to some nice, nice. I used to work for a company. Every year they'd have a, a banquet, have a trip. If you wanted a trip, you'd go on this trip to, to Florida, boy, and they'd have the awards banquet, they called it. Big old room full, big old uh, tables, and all kinds of good eating, Brother Flood. I'm telling you, man, I overeat every time I went down there. And uh, I'd carry my wife. We'd, you know what? We'd all dress up, man. This is something special. We'd go out to that ban- big banquet. And, of course, Jesus here is talking about a banquet. He's co- comparing it to salvation that you're invited to. You think about this great invitation you receive. You think about some great meals you've had. Now, I've had some good meals, too. I've eaten all kinds of stuff. Yes, sir. We ain't going there. I'll make you hungry. You'll lose you, lose you right in the middle of the sermon. So, uh, but, but I've been to some, and salvation's here compared to a great supper. That means that the table of salvation is everything the human heart could desire. Think about that for a moment. Put that in reality. Bowls of joy, sauces of love. That's everything that you could desire. That's what God is talking about in this banquet feast, this banquet supper. Everything the human heart could desire, God has placed on this banquet table for you. And he's put it in salvation. And he extends this invitation. And he says you can come to this great supper. And I'm grateful and thankful we can. In a little while, I'll issue that invitation. I hope God will allow you to come and speak to your heart, open your heart to this truth. I want you to see, first of all, the invitation is extended. How this invitation is extended is extended. Now, the Bible talks about it here in verse number 16. Jesus here is talking, and he says a man has, in this parable, he says a man has prepared a great supper. And then he says in verse 17 that he sends out his servant. When it comes time, he sends out his servant, of course. And his servant goes out and he invites folks with this invitation. He made the announcement, come, look at it right there, verse 17. Come, for all things are now ready. Oh, my. What a great invitation. 
the simplicity of that invitation. You know what he said? Come. Come. All through the word of God, you'll find that word, come. I started to look up how many times it's mentioned in the Bible. It's the great theme, underlining theme of the whole Bible. God says, come. Come. Will you come to him? Hey, he says, come. We know that that tells us, of course, that God takes this invitation and the initiative in salvation. Unless you're invited, you're not going to come. God has to open your heart to the truth. I've said some things about that, but that's a reality. When I was a boy, God began to deal with my heart to help me realize between wrong and right. And I started realizing I'm on the wrong. I do a lot of wrong. How do you get forgiveness of that wrongdoing? How do you get turned around? And God extends this gospel invitation. And it's God who makes the first step to the human heart. It's God that brings that reality to you. If you've ever been saved, you had to realize you were lost and undone without God. And he says, come. The very simplicity of that word, come. First invitation in the Bible, Old Testament, Noah built an ark. And you remember what God said? He said, come on in. Come into the ark. He didn't say, y'all go in the ark. He said, y'all come in the ark. He's already in there for them. He's waiting on them. Come into the ark. All through the Bible, you study. Isaiah said it this way. Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. God's talking there. And God says, come. Let's reason about this problem you got. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And the Old Testament people understood what he was saying there. He's literally talking about a cleansing that only God could do. Only God could do. You come to the New Testament, Jesus picks up on that invitation. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That person in, in sin is like, on the, uh, uh, like going down in deep water. They're struggling, trying to stay afloat, struggling, trying to stay afloat. And Jesus says, come, come on over here, just trust me. Lean on me. I'll, I'll give you rest. You don't have to struggle. I'll rescue you. I'll save you. The Bible talks about it in John chapter 6. Jesus talking to a group of religious folks there. And he told them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And then he makes this powerful statement in verse number 37. He said, all that the Father giveth me. Now what's he saying there? He's saying God has to open your heart to the truth. It'll have to be God for you to realize you're lost. I'm telling you, I, I heard a lot of sermons when I was a boy. Raised in a preacher's home. You're going to hear a lot. Mom and dad. No. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, the Bible was read to me every day of my life, Brother Barry. I was raised in a Christian home. My, my, my mom and dad were devout Christians. I love them, and I thank God for them. My daddy was a preacher, a country preacher that loved God, and he, he and mom uh, established that Christian home long before I was born, decided they were going to have a Christian home exactly the way things were going to be. And they, uh, of course, uh, one of them was that we were going to read the Bible and pray every day, and we did. Now, on Sunday, thank the Lord, I could come to the church service, and Sunday night, we just have prayer time because we've been under the Word of God. But on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, every day I was home, we'd have to read a verse, our verses, our chapters, whatever, whatever. I, I, I don't begrudge this at all. And then we'd have a time of prayer. Sometime Daddy would say, let's just all pray together tonight. We just all pray. Sometime he'd say, we're just going to pray individually tonight. Joel, you start us, and we'll just come around the room. And each one of us would pray. The importance of prayer. Oh, you see, the Bible talks about it. All that the Father giveth me. God had to open my heart to the truth. Even though I was really raised in all that, it wasn't until God showed me I had to be saved as an individual. I, I couldn't go to heaven on my daddy's religion, on my mama's professional faith. No, no, no. They love God. They love me. But God had to save me. God began to woo at my heart and help me realize all that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast him out. The Bible talks about Jesus is saying those words. That little word come, you ever thought about it? C-O-M-E. You can do an acrostic with that word. And it literally spells out the word come and who can come. First of all, see, children can come. You remember what Jesus said? He said, you suffer, the, allow those little children to come unto me and forbid them not. 
Oh, no, we shouldn't. Hey, we shouldn't never tamper with your kids. Now, we, we had some kids saved in Bible school. And, and uh, I'm thankful for the kids we have saved in Bible school. We try to present a clear picture of salvation. They come up here. We have a lot of kids respond. I can't tell you how many kids we had respond to vacation Bible school. A lot of them come up. And our question, I, I counsel our counselors and I tell them, you ask that kid why they come up here. If they can't tell you why they're coming, that God's not dealing with their heart. Now, he, they may be worried about something. They might want to pray about something. But if they can't verbally say, hey, I, I, I need something in my heart. I need something in my life. God's not dealing with them. You don't need to carry them through the plan of salvation. You just pray for them. Have a little prayer with them. Tell them you love them. And ask God to continue to speak to them. Because God's the only one who can open the heart. C is for the children. Uh, o is for older people. Is that, is that your category? That's my category. M is for the middle age. You know, the middle aged folks. And ease for everybody. C O M E. Come. We can come. I'm thankful God invites us to come. The simplicity. I remember years ago I was walking in, working in jail ministry and inmates. And I had a bunch of inmates, boy, I'm telling you, so confused about salvation. One, one guy said he hadn't eaten days because he was praying, wanting God to save him. And I said, uh, okay, I understand what you're doing there, but. Uh, he said, somebody said, I'd have to go without food and water for so many days before God would save me. I said, well, I hate to tell you, brother, but that's nowhere in the Bible. Now, I understand your sincerity, and you're trying to show God your sincerity, uh, but that's nowhere in the Bible. I'll never forget the day I got saved. I talked to one fellow, and I was telling him, explaining to him about how to be saved if God was dealing with him. I said, now, you've got to understand whether or not it's God dealing with your heart. Tell, tell me about it. Why, why are you coming and talking to me as a, as a chaplain at the, in jail ministry, talking to inmates? He started talking to me. And he said, well, and I started explaining to him about salvation. He said, that sounds too simple. I can remember as a boy when I got saved several years later, Brother Corey. We lived next door to, well, it was in the other county. We lived on the county line. But it was from here, the house, there's a little, little store in the other county. So I'd walk to the other county every day to the store. And I walk over there, I'll never forget walking over there with my Coca-Cola bottles going to cash them in for a good one. They meant two ones. We do that back when I was a boy. I'm telling my age now. <clears throat> Returnable bottles. And we catch them. And I was carrying some bottles over there to get me a nice cold Coca-Cola. And, and when I was walking over there, it dawned on me about what had happened and transpired in my life about God saving. I said, boy, it's so simple. I, I just prayed. And, and so simple. It sounds too good to be true. Now, a lot of things in life, let's be careful, a lot of things in life that sound too good to be true are too good to be true. Don't get yourself in that mess. Huh? It sounds too good. Sounds like, boy, you're getting the, the deal of the century. You better watch out. You're getting a century of a ripoff. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, seriously, I, I, sound, salvation sounds too good to be true because God, when he opens the heart, you come. And you call upon his name and you trust him as your personal savior. And God does a transaction that only he can do. Yep. It's amazing. And, and of course, it's like, it's like Karen, she cooks almost every Sunday, especially when the kids are in town. We didn't last weekend. But uh, I'm grateful and thankful that she does. My mama used to do that when we was growing up. And uh, we'd all go back over there on certain days and eat with them. And, and it was, it was all, always good. But it's like her, when, when, hey, when she gets it ready, sometimes we go over there, she's still finishing up a few things. I'll go in there and sit down in my easy chair, get me something cold to drink. Daniel will buzz around the kitchen there a little bit. What do I need to help you do, Mama? And after she burns the bread, we, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Oh, me. Uh, anyway. <laughs> it's time to eat, Brother Brandon. It's time to eat. Once the bread's burnt, Brother Dale. It's time, no. It, it, it's time to eat. And she'll say, it's ready. The invitation is given out. Now, what do you think we do? Well, I, I don't know if I want to eat or not. After she's done prepared, boy, it's smelling good. You've seen it. Walk by it. Oh, my. Huh? She's got it on the table ready. Some of y'all, I'm getting you hungry now, getting you ready for lunch. Hang in here with me. What do you do? Well, you take the invitation. She didn't say you have to go out there and jump over three bushes, come back, and let's see if you made it okay, and we'll see if we can eat. No, no, no. The invitation is given. The simplicity, the availability. He, he says here, he said, all things are ready. God's made all the preparation. 
Oh, I'm telling you, if he'd have told me that night when I realized I was lost and on my way to hell, if he'd have said, you've got to crawl over this whole auditorium, Joel, you've got to get down on your knees right down here in this aisle. I was over here on this side from the pulpit. I don't know about where Miss Brenda is, somewhere back in there with my mom and daddy. And God began to open my heart. Boy, I was broken in my heart, realizing I was lost and on my way to hell. If, if he'd have said, God would have said, and he'd opened the Bible and said, listen, if you're going to be saved, you have to get on your knees and crawl the length of this whole auditorium before you can be saved. You know what I'd have done? I'd have done it. I realized I was lost. I realized I needed to be saved. But that's not what the Bible says. God said I've already made all the preparation. I sent my son to die in your place. That was the penalty of sin. And on the cross, every tear, every groan, every part of his dying on that cross was for you. That's the preparation I made for you. That's how much God loves me. He gave his only begotten son. Would you give one of your children? I got three boys. I couldn't begin to even think about that. Any of them. Either. Grandchildren, for sure. Got one sitting over here. She said, you better not give me up, Pop Jay. I wouldn't dare think about it. I couldn't. There's no way. But God, in his love for us, he gave his only begotten son. To die on that cross, to go through that suffering, that shame, just for you and I, he did all the work. God's done everything necessary for you and me to be saved. I'm glad salvation's free, but it's not cheap. It cost heaven the great darling of heaven. It cost heaven the grandest thing, the son, the only begotten son. I was reading about D.L. Moody. He was on a train one time. He was talking to a man about being saved. Talking to a man about God, dealing with his heart. Evangelist back in the 1800s. He's riding that train. The man started talking to him. And a little while they began to talk to him. And he talked about what is required for salvation. This man began to tell him what he thought was required for salvation. What he's been doing. He said, there's one problem you have here, sir, between what the Bible says and what you're doing. It comes down to two letters. You're saying do, D-O, do, D-O. Do, D-O. He said, what God done in salvation is done. D-O-N-E. It's already done. It's already done. You have to receive it. But the only way you can receive it is God shows you that. And God speaks to your heart. You see, religion says, go, do. Salvation says, come, be. Be what God wants you to be. Religion says, go try, earn your salvation. Jesus said, he paid it all. He paid the whole debt for you. All you have to do is come and receive it. Now, the invitation, of course, is extended with simplicity. It's extended with availability. But it's also extended with punctuality. You notice it right there in that verse? Yes, come for all things are, that next word, now. Somebody say, I'll get saved when I want to. No, you won't. You get saved when God gives you the invitation. Now. Now. Now already is what he said. Now's the invitation. Send that word now. And of course, God's already done the part. He's already done in preparation for this glorious meal we call salvation. Or we're looking at it in that terminology this morning. He's already done it. You just have to come and receive it. You have to come and accept it. You have to acknowledge that you need it. Oh, I'm telling you. Will you come to Jesus when the invitations come? Will you do what God wants you to do in your heart and your life when we have the invitation in a few moments? Ah, uh, somebody says, well, I would, preacher, but there's a lot of hypocrites in church. Yeah, there are. You've heard this, haven't you? Some, somebody else will say, I'm, I'm not coming to give my life to the Lord because there's just too much to give up. I've heard that before. My years of giving this invitation is talking to people. When I get saved, I'm going to have this... When I feel like it, I have to have a feeling from God. I'll know when to get saved. Well, you'll feel something all right when you get saved. But if you're waiting for a feeling, you're not listening to the voice of God. It's not wrapped up in a feeling. I'll come and get saved when I think I can live it. You won't ever do it. You won't ever do it. I'm telling you, you see, those are apparent acceptable reasons, that's what these people gave, acceptable reasons, you know, here in the Bible. But the, but the Bible tells us, of course, in these verses, it tells us that they wasn't good enough. What do you mean by that? It's actually unreasonable. Now look at this. Not only is this invitation uh, extended, but it's, it's evaded. That's what a lot of people do with the invitation. That may be what you do with the invitation this morning. 
evade it. Verse number 17, the servant goes out. He calls everybody says, it's now ready. Preparation's been made. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come. Yesterday's gone. Behold, now's the accepted time, God says. And, and I can imagine this servant doing what the master wants him to do. And he goes out, and he's already got this table all spread. He's already seen what's going to transpire, boy, in this great meal that's prepared. And he goes out, and he knocks on the door, and the Bible says in these verses, he goes out, and he begins to try to invite folks to this feast, to this banquet, to salvation. Hey, everybody wants to hear about a salvation, hear about the invitation, but not everybody responds. All these years of preaching I've done in these many years, I've seen a lot of people. Here in verse number 18, I've discovered a lot of people are not favorable to the invitation, just like these people were. He invites them. I can see him as he knocks on the door. First door he comes to, he knocks on the door, and a guy in a business suit comes to the door and says, yes, may I help you? And the guy says, all things are ready. You've been invited to a luxurious supper. Everything's ready. Why don't you come? And he says, I, I, I'm sorry, but I bought a piece of land. And I've got to go, <laughs> I've got to go look at it. Have me excused. Hmm. Kind of smile on his face. And the second guy, he goes to the second guy. He's kind of puzzled. The servant is. He knocks on the door. This guy comes to the door with his cowboy boots on, his hat on. He says, how are you doing, partner? He says, well, I'm doing good. I want to invite you to a banquet. All things are now ready. You've been invited to a great supper. Right. Will you come? And the guy says, well, <laughs> I'll tell you, partner, I, I've just uh, bought a yoke of oxen, two oxen, and I've got to go out there and test them. Have me excused. He nods, and the servant goes on his way, and he goes to the third house and knocks on that door, and he knocks on this door. The person opens the door standing there in a tuxedo. Still got a little flower on the lapel. He invites him. said, the supper's ready. Will you come? He said, oh, man, you don't understand. Well, I just got married. Now, get this. He just got married. So he invites him. He said, I, I can't come. I, I just got married. There's no way I can come. So he walks off and he goes back to his Lord. Now, the first guy, of course, what's he going to do? Go, go look at a piece of property at dark? Yeah. Supper time. It's getting dark. He's going to go look at that land he's bought? Now, we do buy, know people buy sight unseen or whatever, but they've seen some pictures, I promise you. They've seen something. Somebody's told them about it. Yes, he's just making an excuse. Yeah. The second guy's just making an excuse. Well, who would buy, uh, to us, who would buy a car without trying it? Unless it's going to good reputation. But then you know it's still good. You go tomorrow. It's, and this, that's the last guy, but he just got married. You know his wife don't know how to cook. Right. Here's a great meal. He's going to miss a great meal. Amen. Already prepared. I guarantee you, if that guy's wife would have come to the door, they'd been going to that banquet. Yeah. Now, what do you mean by that? She said, oh, yeah, we'll go. We already stressed up. We'll go. We'll have another party. Uh, <laughs> no, they all reneged on the invitation. You see, they all give in to the invitation. What They all evaded the invitation. They made excuse. Then, of course, I want you to see here, the Bible talks about it. People make excuses. Everybody makes excuses sometime or another. They have, haven't they? I, I talked about these excuses that the people make. Oh, man. Uh, the first guy, of course, he's lying. The second guy, he don't know what he's doing. And the third guy, you know, he, he's in bad shape. But, but, but they don't come because... Why? They don't want to. They don't want to. Hmm? Somebody says there's too many hypocrites in church. That's the reason I don't go to church. If I want to know I've pastored, I want you to know I've been pastoring many years. I've pastored a bunch of hypocrites. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, we got some on our church row here now. Can't get them to come. Uh, they profess they know the Lord, profess they, whatever. Some of them I hadn't seen. In the years I've been here as pastor, and that's a long time, both times, still hadn't seen in this house. And, and they're on the church membership row. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying there's hypocrites. There's all kinds of hypocrites. There are hypocrites in everything. Do you know that? Exactly. Not just in church. There are hypocrites. There's some doctors who are quacks. There's some lawyers that are charlatans. Uh, but that don't make them all bad. 
No, I don't make them all bad. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. They're hypocrites in church. But that simply proves that there are people that are real. Some people are real. Some people are not. We understand that. We understand that. I'd rather sit between two hypocrites and still die and go to heaven than to go to hell where they're all going to be. Hello? Hypocrites. And somebody says, well, I don't know, preacher. I I can't come to church. It's too much to give up. You hear that excuse? You thought about that excuse? In in fact, there's not a whole lot to give up when you think about it. Except one thing. Sin. That's what's robbing you of joy and happiness in your life. That's what's going to keep you out of heaven. Unless you turn from that sin. I don't want to give up my sin. I met people that didn't want to give up their sin. I talked to a guy one time. Well, I'm telling you, he's a hardened criminal, and I could tell God was dealing with his heart. I said, don't you want to trust God and have a change in your life? He said, I would, preacher, but I got too much out there. And he said, They're going to, I'm going to get out of jail. And he said, they'll never catch me again. They didn't. The guy out in Tennessee shot him and killed him. And I thought about that. It rung in my ears when I heard that news about this boy. I thought about it. He said, got too much to give, got too much on the outside to give up. The only thing you give up is your sin. And God can give you a brand new life. God can give you a, 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 a change in your life. Think about this. Reminds me of the guy going to the hospital and the doctor walks in to his room and says, well, you have a, I've examined you. We've done these tests. We've done these scans. Under your left arm, there's a cancerous growth that needs to come out. If you don't, it's already growing, and it's going to spread even further and take your life. Can you imagine that guy, if he's in his right mind, can you imagine him saying, well, I don't know if I want to get rid of that or not. I've had it for a while now, and I've enjoyed watching it grow. I I don't know really if if I really want to give that up. Huh? That's what a lot of people do with sin, don't they? Not giving up sin. Not wanting to give up their sin. Somebody says, well, I'll get saved when I feel like it. When I get the feeling, I'm going to get saved. You're not going to ever get the feeling. God's giving you the facts. I'm glad I felt something after I got saved. I felt relief from the burden of sin and the guilt of my sin. But the more I read the Bible, the more I study the Bible, I cannot point to you one single verse in which you have to have a certain feeling to get saved. You have to have the realization in your heart, and sometimes that comes with a feeling of a broken heart. I, I had a feeling the night I got saved, but it wasn't the feeling that was changing my heart. It was God that was calling me, and I realized that. You're not saved by feelings. If that was true, there'd be some mornings I'm not in until about 10 o'clock. I'm not in the fold. <laughs> I'm telling you, some mornings I just don't feel saved, huh? but I still know I'm saved. Thank God. I says, well, I'm going to wait till I can live it. I've heard that in a lot. Sounds real good. But you think about it. Would you, that's like going to the water and saying, I'm not going to get in until I know I can swim. How idiotic is that? Think about it. I'm not going to get in that water until I know I can swim. Well, you ain't even going to, you don't know what swimming is until you get in the water. Oh, my. That's like somebody saying, I'm not going to touch that piano until I know I can play it. Duh. Ain't got to worry about you touching the piano. It'll never happen. That's what people are saying when they say, when I can live it, I'll go. I'll get saved when I can live it. I'm going to tell you, you won't do it till it happens in your heart and your life. Allow God to do that work in your heart. Your life excuses or alibi excuses or lullabies that lull people to sleep and make them, of course, uh, put off salvation. Put off salvation. Now look at verse 21. The master of the house, he becomes angry. Now his anger, of course, is apparent because of those that have rejected him. It's not a, 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 a hard, it's, it's a wounded love is what he's angry about. He's wounded in his heart. And that's what's happening. And he says, you go out there, these have made excuses. These weren't alibi excuses. These were lullabies to lure them away into danger. And, of course, then he says, you go on out there. Extend that invitation. Extend that invitation, verse 21. He, he said, go out quickly, the streets and the lanes, and bring in what? The poor, 
the maimed, the halt, the blind. Am I talking to somebody this morning? You're in that condition? Sin has beat you up pretty bad. I'm telling you, you've been blinded to the truth. God wants to open your eyes to the truth and help you accept him today. Oh, but then the last of all, the ex- invitations expanded. After they still had room, the Lord comes back, the man comes back. Look at it, verse 21 again. He said, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes, bring in the poor and the main, the lame, the blind. He's extended it to everybody. Well, we got a lot of people hurting around us. We can tell them the gospel, that God can make a change in their life. But then he says in verse number 22, the servant comes back and said, Lord, we've done everything you said to do, and the room still has room. Still got room at the table. Amen. He said, verse 23, go out in highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Yeah. Compel them. That's a strong word. Highways and hedges, whosoever will, as God gives you opportunity to drop the seed, invite somebody to tell them about this wonderful salvation. That's what he's talking about. Invite them. Encourage them. Let God do something in their heart. Let God do something in their life. And compel them. That word compel is is urgency. Compel them. Urgency. Get an urgency about watching for people that you can Plant the seed. You can say something about God to them. You can tell them there's a better way in their life. God's got a better plan. Constrain them is literally what it carries with it. Urge them. Compel them to come. The urgency. Now, why does the Lord say it's urgent to come? Jude, verse 23, he talks about in these last days apostasy. He said, others save with fear, snatching them from the fire. He said, time's running out. Yes, sir. He said, they're in dire straits. That's how we need to see them. Oh, yeah. That's how we need to reach out to them. Yes, sir. I can probably go around this room and ask every one of you on that Tuesday morning at 8.46 a.m. and then 17 minutes later at 9.03 a.m. on September the 11th, 2001, you remember where you was at. Yes, because you saw a horrible thing take place. Yes, sir. I remember it, man, just like it was yesterday. Yes, sir. I can remember where I was at. I was at work. I can remember going in that conference room, turning on that TV, and watching it live as that second one yes, sir. came in after I heard it. After the first one, in less than 17 minutes, I yes, turned on the TV to see what's happening and watched it. If you haven't seen it, you've seen the video. If you wasn't live where you could watch it that day, you've seen the video over and over. These last years, we've seen the horrors. And you remember? I remember it. Watching them as TV live, as streaming those things. And the people are standing above that fire in the smoke and in heat excess of 2,000 degrees. Many of them, what? Jumped and fell out of those buildings. Estimated between 100 and 200 people jumped or fell out of that building. Before it collapsed. Each one of those towers, World Trade Centers, North and South Tower, that day. Why did they do that, preacher? Why? They're trying to escape the smoke. They're trying to escape the flames. They're trying to escape that excessive heat. Can I tell you, if you and I could ever see people where they're headed, we'd get an urgency to try to say something that would help them understand that God's got a banquet. He's got a dinner. He wants to save them. If they'll just listen to his voice as he opens their hearts, he speaks to them. Don't turn him away. Am I talking to you today? God opening your heart to this truth, you realize you need to be saved? God is calling you. It ain't me, it's God. God does that work. You see, God is the one that opens our heart. Is God doing a work in your life today? He's compelling you to take another step, follow him in obedience to baptism. Our church, get involved in the things of God. What is God telling you to do? Will you be obedient during this invitation time? It's time. It's time for the invitation. Let's stand together. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. They're coming with a song. We invite you to come. God's speaking to your heart now. Will you be obedient to God in this invitation? Whatever God wants you to do, 
God's opened your heart to the truth of salvation. You've never been saved, but yet you realize that this morning. God is so real, speaking to you and letting you know that, that you need to come and trust him. Will you come? Or God's deal with your heart about what he wants you to do. Join in the church, will you come? While we sing this verse, I'm going to pray, then we're going to sing. God speaking to you, come. Father, I want to thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our hearts, what you want to do. Continue, Lord, to have your way in this invitation. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're singing. 85. God speaking to you, you come. Come on, come on.